in a while, I find myself complaining about petty things and then realize how petty it is and say, well, first world problems. I have a list of some first world problems. Out of a list of 50, I'm just, I'm just gonna read some off for you. If you've ever struggled with this before. First world problems. When you spend so long looking for something to watch on Netflix that your dinner gets cold. When you have to go all the way upstairs to get your laptop charger. First world problems. The moment when you have to wait 4.5 seconds deciding whether or not to hold the door for someone because they're at an awkward distance. You know that feeling? When you crack your iPad screen because you dropped your iPhone on it. When one click on your mechanical pencil isn't enough and two is just way too much. When your dentist ceiling TV is set to the wrong aspect ratio. <laughs> when your smartphone changes LOL small caps to LOL capitals, making you sound way more amused than you actually are. Man, that's irritating. When your backup camera is fogged up in the morning, so you have to actually turn your head to see what's behind you like some kind of 19th century stagecoach driver. <laughs> when the headlights of the SUV behind you hurts your eyes, when you're in your Ferrari. That's tough, it's very tough. Well, I got tons and tons of these, but uh, let's see. When your, box, your new box of Kleenex is so tightly packed that the first few tissues tear when you pull them out. Man, that's irritating. That moment when after buying three huge monitors, you can't find your mouse cursor. I've got multiple monitors, I know how horrible that is. When you step on a bit of water in the kitchen floor and now have a wet spot on your sock. Okay, so anyway, we have these things that we think, oh man, this is, this life is hard, it's so hard. But then we read about a guy like Paul and then we realize, man, first world problems. We're just big wimps when it comes down to it sometimes. In reading 2 Corinthians, it's gonna help us get back in touch with, with what really it means to suffer and how God uses suffering in our lives as a good thing, how he meets us in our suffering as we see today. So the central theme of 2 Corinthians, you'll notice that it, it, it feels different and it has a different theme and purpose than 1 Corinthians, which just goes to show you, you know, one in the same church with very different times, they're struggling with different things. Um, and so Paul speaks into their situation. The central theme here is the relationship between suffering and the power that God provides to get through it. And so God brought about salvation through Christ's weakness. When he was crucified on the cross, he suffered, yet there we find the power of salvation. And so we see the same kind of example displayed in Paul's life as he suffers for the gospel and experiences weakness in his life. It's compensated for by the power of God. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he says this about when Jesus spoke to him in his suffering. He says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, he says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And so there we see a theme, one of the major themes in this whole letter. Second Corinthians ends up being one of the most personal of Paul's letters, filled with deep emotion. You really wanna to get to know the heart and the man, 2 Corinthians helps us to understand. Paul planted the church in Corinth way back in 50 AD. 
20 years after Christ. He spent 18 months there helping the church grow. The book of 2 Corinthians is actually the fourth letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. We, we don't have two of the letters, but they're referred to in 1 Corinthians and in 2 Corinthians. But Paul wrote 2 Corinthians from Macedonia, which if we look at this map here, sorry, I'm jumping ahead to a map. Um, the map will show you Macedonia is north of Greece or of Corinth. It's part of Greece. And you'll see Thessalonica is there and Berea. And that's where Paul writes this letter from and he has it sent south to the city of Corinth. He wrote it in 55 to 56 AD. So about five years after the church was planted, this is before his third visit to Corinth, which he only is there three times that we see in scripture anyway. It is one year after he wrote 1 Corinthians, but also one year before he writes Romans and he actually writes Romans from Corinth when he goes down there. And so interesting information helps you connect the different letters of 1 Corinthians and Romans. But we begin in verse one with Paul's greeting to the saints in Achaia. Ancient letters begin kind of the opposite of our letters. They begin with the sender, the sender. So it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. And so the letter is sent by both Paul and Timothy with Paul as the main author. Notice how this time Paul says he is an apostle of Christ. Apostle of Christ. You know, a lot of times Paul says servant of Christ um, or a slave of Christ. I'm a slave of Christ. You know, it's very humble, very um, servant hearted. But Paul here says, apostle. Why does he call himself an apostle now? Well, as we'll see in this letter, people question Paul's apostleship and his credibility because of the amount of suffering that he went through serving God. And so there were these so-called super apostles, call, Paul calls them that tongue in cheek to make fun of them because they think they're super spiritual, healthy and wealthy and all this kind of stuff. And so therefore they're more blessed and they look down on Paul and they tell the Corinthians, yeah, Paul, he, he must've done something bad because he suffers so much. So his opponents claim that he couldn't be a true apostle, but Paul's sufferings as we see become the very means for God's grace to be poured out, God's power to be dispensed to him and God's comfort to be manifest in his life. And so Paul is a guy who's been through it and he's still holding on tight with his integrity to the Lord and his love for Jesus. So he establishes his authority again, an apostle of Christ, because he has to. He has to remind them of that. And then he also says, by the will of God, you know, this was not Paul's idea to be an apostle. He was called by Christ on the road to Damascus in Acts. You can read all about it. But notice the humility and the confidence in his calling. You know, the humility of saying, this is something God called me to. This was not my ambition, but also the confidence to be able to stand in that calling, even when people were questioning and attacking him and just humbly say, you know what? It's by the will of God. So Paul and Timothy, and then it goes on to the recipients, what we normally have at the beginning of our letters, to the church of God that is at Corinth with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia. He does not say to my church in Corinth that I planted, he says to the church of God. I like that. The church is God's church built by Jesus Christ. It belongs to no man even if it's planted by a man, um, it belongs to God. But another thing to remember is this is like saying, you know, people that are called out by God as an assembly together. Um, it's not the church of God is in a building. It's a church of God is in the people. The people, the assembly, the fellowship belongs to God. 
buildings, well, they're going to one day turn to dust. Ah, I'd like to have a building, of course, but, you know, it's good to <laughs> keep that perspective sometimes. And we think of going to church, you know, going to whatever location, but it is the people. He, he addresses this to all the saints, all the saints. And this is a title that's used of every believer. The Bible calls us a saint, which means holy one, or dedicated to Christ, set apart for God. And that might sound uncomfortable to refer to yourself as a saint, but here's the reality is, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and he gives you his righteousness, and he takes upon himself your sinfulness. There was a great exchange that happened so that now through faith, you are righteous in the sight of God. Now through Christ's work, you are considered holy. You are a saint. So it is both an identity that we have in Christ, but it's also a way of life, a way of life. And so we become more like the identity that God has given us more and more each day. In 1 Peter 1.14, we see this calling to be holy. Not only are we called holy, but calling to be holy. It says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And so we live up to that calling of being a saint. And it's a good reminder. But notice how he not only talks about the church in Corinth, but the whole of Achaia. And again, we'll turn to this map and you'll see that Achaia is a larger region on the southern part of the Grecian peninsula. Corinth is just one city in this whole region. But from Corinth, when the gospel went out and a church was planted like spokes on a wheel, the gospel went out to all the surrounding areas and more churches began. And again, these churches were in homes. They were in homes. The point that Paul makes in referring to the whole of Achaia, not just those um, uppity Christians in Corinth, who we know had a problem with pride, remember? They had a problem with pride, and so they probably thought, we're in the big city, we are the important church. But Paul points out, no, not only is the church God's church, but all of those churches in Achaia are God's church. And so sometimes we do put importance on a church over another, but it's not the way God thinks. So it's important for Paul to mention the other churches to squash that pride, to help people remember you are brothers and sisters in Christ, even in the less prominent regions. There's no such thing as second-class Christians in the kingdom of God. Well, in verse two, we see the greeting, grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Greek world, they would greet each other with a word that's similar to grace. It basically means hello. But here it's specifically a different word. And it's used by the Christians to greet one another, purposefully different, intentionally to point out that we greet each other with a richer meaning. You know, grace to you, which means God's undeserved favor upon you. When we talk about grace, maybe you've heard this acronym before, God's riches at Christ's expense. You know, it's an important thing to remember. So we greet each other with grace to you as Christians, but we also, as Paul here says, peace to you, peace. Now this word peace represents the Hebrew word shalom. You know, if you hear... Um, Jewish folks greet each other. You might hear that, shalom. In Hawaii, you're, you'll hear aloha, you know, 
uh, whatever. Uh, th- there is always that kind of greeting. But in, in Hebrew, shalom means peace, but it's a richer peace than just the lack of conflict. It is a peace that extends to the very core of your being. Like the ESV study Bible says here, not untroubled circumstances, but the profound well-being that comes from resting in God's sovereignty and mercy, a concept first expressed by the Hebrew shalom. So these greetings, though we oftentimes fly by them, there's a lot of depth and meaning and heart behind them. Um, Well, and we move on to verse three, where we see our second point, that God feels our pain and comforts those that suffer. Now, if you're used to reading Paul's letters, he oftentimes starts with a thanksgiving at this point. He has the initial introduction to the letter, and then he goes, and I thank God for all of you. And he goes through all these things that he's thankful for about that church. But here it's different. Paul gives what's called a benediction, benediction. And so verse three, blessed be. So when you see the blessed be, that is a Jewish formula for a blessing. The Hebrew word baraka, a blessing or a benediction. It's a Jewish praise formula that was often used in the synagogues. Blessed be. It means you're praising God for the benefits that the speaker who's blessing God has experienced personally. So this is not something I don't think I've seen practice much in the church is benedictions. I I think maybe in some uh, more traditional churches, they have the benedictions or whatever, but blessed be. And then you share what God has done in your life. Blessed be God. In Psalm 66, 20, it says, We see this same Baraka, blessing, benediction. Blessed be God because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. Then in Psalm 72, 18, blessed be the Lord Yahweh, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. We see it also in 1 Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And it goes on. And so in your prayer life, do you bless God? You know, we often pray for God's blessing. God bless me, bless the people in my life, but we can bless God. We worship him for things done in our lives And so he says here, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, a father of mercies and God of all comfort. And so this benediction leads to a great experience that Paul has had of the heavenly father in his life. And there are two things, two names that he calls God. The father of mercies, the father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Well, the father of mercies. What does he mean by that? Well, uh, this word mercy means a deep awareness of and sympathy for another person's suffering. You know, God is not just a far off God saying, you know, suck it up, big wimps, you know. Though, as we'll talk about, He is a God that allows suffering because he wants to toughen us up. He wants to strengthen us, but he doesn't do it heartlessly. When and if we experience suffering, God is right there in the midst of your suffering and he feels for you in the midst of it. He has tender compassion when you suffer. Psalm 56, 8. I read this one last week. You have kept count of my tossings. You know, have you ever suffered to the point where you just toss back and forth on your bed? Maybe your body aches. Maybe you just gotta 
puke <laughs> and you're just tossing back and forth or you can't clear your nose out or whatever it is, you know. God keeps count of how many times you toss and he feels it with you. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? You know, and he keeps track of it all. We don't even care about our suffering that much to keep track of our tossings or our tears, but our father does. Christ can identify with our suffering because he became one of us and suffered greater than anybody else on the face of the earth could suffer, I believe. In John eleven thirty five, 35, when Lazarus died and Martha and Mary were suffering in mourning. Jesus, knowing full well he was gonna raise Lazarus from the dead, he didn't say, okay, ladies, chill out. I got this one. No, John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. He took time to feel the suffering with them. He took time to grieve over his friend and all that he had gone through four days prior when he was sick unto death. Jesus wept. So notice that, that God is not a distant, suck it up kind of God. He is a God who wants to grow and strengthen you, but he does it alongside of you. He is also the God of all comfort. The God of all comfort. Either by verbal or nonverbal means. You know, we can comfort one another by verbal or nonverbal. You know, sometimes there are no words, and what you need to do is sit and listen attentively or give somebody a hug or hold their hand. There's a comfort that comes through your presence, but there's also comfort that comes through words, and God does all of that. This word comfort means a source of encouragement or strength, help, or comfort in times of disappointment. In verses three through seven, this word occurs 10 times. So if you're a Bible study student, you may circle all the occurrences of the word comfort in those, that short section of verses three through seven. It's an important word. Jesus was also a comforter. So we know the Father's a comforter, Jesus is a comforter, and we know this because he said, I'm gonna send to you another helper, another comforter. In the Greek, that word means another of the same kind. So he's saying, I'm a comforter, I've been here with you. I've wept with you, but I'm gonna depart and go to the Father and I'm gonna send another one, the Holy Spirit. And so the Trinity the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are all comforting in our lives. And so if you thought God didn't care, man, how wrong are you? This comfort comes from knowing him and being close to him and feeling his presence and hearing his word, his promises. God is the source of comfort. Jesus is the conduit. The Holy Spirit applies it. And when you receive the comfort, you can become God's comfort delivery system in the life of another person, as we'll see in this chapter. When we suffer and we experience comfort, there, there's a deep fellowship with God in suffering. You will grow closer and deeper than you ever have. He will glorify himself in your suffering. He magnifies himself. Like suffering is like a magnifying glass that you hold up to God and in God magnifies something about himself in the midst of it. And if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. Um, Paul is excited about this. And so he blesses God that, that God meets him in the suffering, not that God withholds the suffering, that, but that God meets him in it. In verse four, we see that this comfort's meant to be shared. It says, who comforts us in all our affliction so that, when, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And so God will meet us in our affliction. 
And that's one of the first things he says here. He meets us in our affliction. And this word affliction means distress. It means an oppressive state of physical, mental, social, or economic distress. And so affliction can be outward by your circumstances, things that you experience that are very difficult, or they can be inward, like a state of mind. This word affliction comes from a noun meaning to crush, press, compress, or squeeze. Have you ever felt under that kind of pressure? Maybe in your own mind and heart, and you suffered and nobody knows or nobody can tell. You're good at hiding it. Or maybe it's outward and there's no hiding it. We've been crushed and pressed and squeezed. But in 2 Corinthians 4, 8, again, as this is one of the great themes in Corinthians, it says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Oh man, that's awesome. You're gonna be pressed, but you won't be crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. You won't understand sometimes why, but you won't be in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. You know, I think when when Christians get squeezed, good stuff comes out. Sometimes some bad stuff has to come out first, you know? And then eventually the good stuff starts coming out. You know, like when you squeeze grapes and produce grape juice or when you squeeze oil and produce olive oil. You know, sometimes you got to be crushed for good things to come out. And here it's comfort, the comfort of the Lord. And so that's what Paul says. You know, we've been through this and we've been comforted. And one of the reasons why we suffer is so that we can share that comfort with others. You can always be sure that one of the purposes of your suffering is to help others that suffer. So be encouraged with that, that God is going to use you somehow in something that you're suffering with to be there for somebody else. And if you're not willing to be there with somebody else, maybe God's challenging you today. You know, step up, speak up. If you notice somebody going through something you've been through, come alongside of them. And so God gives us comfort. We receive it. We experience it, but then we pass it on. Strengthening our brothers and sisters. One of the best ways we can do that, you know, you you can share the comfort you received. And sometimes that's a testimony, sometimes that's a verse. But also, I think one of the great ways we can share our comfort is to tell people how we entered into that moment that we heard God's voice. To share with people how we entered into that moment when we felt his embrace. Because oftentimes, that's what people need is they need you to connect them to the Father. We can only do so much. The Heavenly Father, He is the Comforter. In verse 5, for as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Notice how He's talking about sharing in Christ's sufferings. I love the fact that we have a God who is not far off and who can't relate with us. Not only has he been tempted in every way, just as we have been tempted, so he can relate with us in temptation, but also he has suffered greatly. So he can relate to you in your suffering. Christ's sufferings. I'm sure he suffered plenty in his life, just like any human being does. We know Joseph was probably dead at this point in his life when he was called to ministry. Mary was there, but his dad, Joseph, was, had passed away. Talk about suffering. He experienced persecution from religious and political leaders during his ministry, but also 
from the time of his arrest to the time of his death. He suffered so much shame, pain, ridicule, separation from the Father. As he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, I think that was the pinnacle of suffering for him. Jesus suffered for us in love. You know, why did he go through it all? Because he loves you. But he also did it because the father loves you and wanted to save you. So he sent his one and only son. And so Christ not only did it in love for you, but in faithfulness and love to the father. Because there was a time when he prayed, Father, take this from me. But not my will, but yours be done. And so we as believers now, as, as we receive Christ's love, we become more willing to suffer for him because he suffered for us. And so out of love for him and out of faithfulness to the father, we suffer as well. And so there's this union between Christ and his followers that's experienced in suffering that is a deep fellowship that maybe you know something about. He'll meet you there. Jesus says, I've been there. And he'll give us what we need in the midst of it. For the apostle Paul, suffering was actually part of his calling. It was part of God's plan for his life. Check this out. In in Acts 9.15, it says, but the Lord said to him, and this is when he was called. He was a persecutor of the church, but Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and he met Christ. It says, um, and the Lord spoke to Um, Ananias that was to reach out to him. He said, go for he, Paul, is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my sake. How'd you like to be that as part of your calling? Straight from God. You're gonna do great things, but man, you are gonna suffer. There are some people that suffer more than others. And Paul was on the side of, man, he was suffering a lot more than your average Christian. In 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 28, he kind of goes through and talks about some of his sufferings. And so I want to read this to you. Um, he's kind of rebuking these false apostles who say, hey, our lives are healthy, wealthy, and all this stuff. He says, are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hand of the Jews, 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned and not with marijuana. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, dangers from my own people, Dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, danger from false brothers in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who wants to sign up to be an apostle? (laughs) That was Paul's calling. But Paul saw his sufferings as sharing in Christ's sufferings. He saw a purpose in it, a fellowship that was deep with Jesus when he went through it. So that he writes this in Philippians 3.10, that I might know him, that's Christ, to be closer to him and um, in deeper fellowship with him and the power of his resurrection and may share his suffering. So sufferings are not all bad. God will use it in our lives. You know, Jesus was right there by Paul's side, identifying with it all. When suffering abounds, so does comfort. When suffering abounds, so does comfort. In verse six, he goes on. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. It's like, man, we're we're doing all this stuff for you guys. And if we are comforted, it's for your comfort. 
which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Sometimes people assume God's punishing them when they suffer. Maybe you've thought it about yourself. Yeah, and there are times when we suffer because of our own sin and bad choices and, and whatnot, but not all suffering is because of sin. Jesus points this out in John 9, 1. It says, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Because in their minds, somebody had to mess up in order for suffering to happen. But Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. No matter what, another purpose you'll always see in suffering is God will glorify himself. The same assumption happened with Job and his friends, you know? Horrible comforters they were, you know, as he's suffering the loss of his kids and his possessions and his own health even. You know, they come to comfort him, but they're like trying to figure out, Job, what did you do? You know, what did you do to make God so mad? But of course, God shuts all their mouths and basically has to say, I'm God, you are not. (laughs) That's what the super apostles did with Paul. So instead of disqualifying him though, Paul's sufferings for Jesus uniquely equipped him to strengthen other believers. Better than any seminary class. Better than any uh, masters of divinity degree suffering. Paul's suffering is not only for his own intimacy with God, but also for the benefit of the church. His suffering caused the gospel to spread. His suffering caused God's comfort to be poured out upon other believers. His suffering caused Christ's power to be displayed in his weakness. And you know what he says? He says, you'll suffer the same things we suffer. You can't live on this earth without suffering of some sort. You might not have the same intensity of suffering as Paul or the same amount of suffering, but you will experience the same kind at some point in your life. It's not a question of if, but when, when it comes to suffering. But here's what he commends them with, that they could patiently endure, patiently endure. And I love this word, patiently endure. It means the power to withstand hardship or stress, especially the inward fortitude necessary. Um, David Guzik in his commentary says this, it isn't the idea of passive bleak acceptance, but the kind of spirit that can triumph over pain and suffering to achieve the goal. It is the spirit of the marathon runner not the victim in the dentist chair. (laughs) Who would you rather be, you know, the whiner or the hero? And so when you're suffering, there's the calling to be that marathon runner and to step up and patiently endure and God will meet you there. In verse seven, he says, our hope for you is unshaken for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. I like this too, that not only does God um, allow suffering, but Paul doesn't wish suffering away for himself or for the other believers. You know, I mean, I have to say it a lot of times, my heart wishes suffering away, you know, for for my fellow believers. I don't want to see people I love suffer. I mean, it's almost harder to watch that than to be the sufferer. But Paul says, our hope for you is unshaken. You know, I've got good hope that suffering will happen and there will be a reason behind it that God uses for your good. If you've experienced intense suffering where God has manifest himself powerfully, Maybe you can share with me that same heart that I wouldn't trade it for anything. Now, I wouldn't sign up to do it again either. (laughs) 
but I wouldn't trade the suffering for anything because of the fruit God produces. Well, the last point here, suffering teaches us to rely on God. In verse eight, for we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced experienced in Asia. And I know in your mind, you might think of Asia like, you know, China and Korea and all, everything over there. But actually, Asia then was modern day Turkey. Asia Minor, maybe you're used to calling it from world history. Uh, it goes on, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself indeed we felt that we had received the sentence of death. Now, I like how Paul starts off verse eight. We do not want you to be unaware. Because what he's doing is he's taking himself off of any pedestal that they have put him on. And he says, let me tell you guys what really the kinds of things I've struggled with. You know, they might see him as Paul the apostle. Never struggles with sin. And never questions what God's doing in his life. But he goes, I don't want you to be unaware. Understand even the greatest spiritual leaders have struggled. So Paul lets him in into his personal life. He opens the curtain or he he makes himself vulnerable. It's as if he's saying, you're not a unique case. You're not a unique case when it comes to depression, despair, or doubt. Spiritual leaders have gone before you and they have struggled too. But what we see in their example is that God is the faithful one. You know, not their great strength in and of themselves, but God is the one that grabbed hold of them and pulled them through and kept them strong. No person can claim the inner fortitude of their own when it comes to victory and suffering. Only God gets that glory. But notice when Paul opens up his life and he's vulnerable, he reveals what he went through. He said, we were burdened beyond our strength. Not many guys like to admit that they were burdened beyond their ability, you know? That kind of reminds me of Jesus falling under the weight of the cross, burdened beyond his strength, so that Simon of Cyrene had to pick it up and carry it for him. If you've been burdened beyond your strength, even Christ can relate. Primarily for Paul, the assumption here is that he was experiencing an inner mental burden as opposed to a physical one like Christ with the cross. He he said, you know, inwardly, I was burdened so much. I, I was falling apart. He said that he despaired, which means to fall apart. Lose one's emotional or mental composure. Have you ever panicked? Have you ever just freaked out? Maybe through extreme despair or anxiety or fear. You know, if you've ever been there, it results in doubt, in embarrassment. And Paul says, you know, I was there. (laughs) I freaked out a little bit. I started falling apart, but... As we talk about Paul's suffering, we're not entirely sure of what the suffering was here because he doesn't give specifics. He leaves it kind of general so that everybody can relate. But whatever it was, it was heavy enough to cause him to want it to take his life. You know you're in a deep place when you're just praying, Lord, just take me. He felt he didn't have the strength to keep going. Some think this could have been an illness. Some think it could be in 1 Corinthians 15, 32, where it says, what do I gain, humanly speaking, if I fought with beasts at Ephesus? You know, that maybe he was in a position um, being attacked like people that were acting like beasts or maybe even put in an arena with beasts. Uh, Who knows? 
But he says, we felt like we had received the sentence of death. (laughs) Well, he goes on, why? Why did Paul go through this? And, And why did this great leader have to like lose his composure? It says, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Here's the great lesson. In those times of trouble, when you realize you're too weak and you don't have what it takes, whatever it is, the great lesson is to make you not rely on yourself, but on God. God often uses suffering to strip away everything we have placed our trust in, whether it be our health, whether it be our marriage, whether it be a spiritual leader or a family member. Those things that we use to stabilize our lives, sometimes God removes them that he might be the stabilizer, that he would be your foundation. And he does this with even the most faithful believers. As Jesus tells us in John 15, he says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, which makes sense. But here's the part that may be harder to understand. It says, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Sometimes pruning is suffering. And God sees a beautiful believer that is reflecting his glory and he wants to take them further. He wants to produce more fruit. So he cuts off some branches and man, it hurts. And it feels like you're missing something in your life, but then eventually fruit starts coming out. But it all starts when we Stop relying on ourself and begin relying on God. And so what do you turn to first when you suffer? You know, we have various schemes to cope. Maybe we live in a dream world where we deny it, act like it's not happening, or uh, we medicate ourselves, or we immerse ourselves in work or other things. I want to encourage you. Don't turn to the coping mechanisms, but Wait upon the Lord, rely upon him. You know, it's there that your faith is grown because you realize God is real and he does meet you where you're at. Sometimes we don't get a chance to experience it because we're too busy trying to find alternative forms of coping. God wants you, he wants your whole heart. But God reveals that he is the God that raises the dead. Now, when we think of it in that terms, that he is the God that raises the dead, is there really anything that we should be afraid of when it comes to suffering if he can overcome death? Even death itself is nothing to fear when you have God on your side because whether he comes through by healing you or by saving you from the circumstance that's causing the suffering, no matter what, We are on the winning side and Christ has risen from the dead and so will he raise us from the dead. And so we will be uh, raised from the dead and restored with a brand new body and enter eternal life. The resurrection is one of the major parts of the gospel. That Jesus died on the cross and he was buried. And, And a lot of times we leave it there And that's where we exist as Christians, you know? Oh, you know, thank you for dying for my sin. And um, which is a pretty big deal, Uh, eternal life and all that, you know, obviously. But then he rose from the dead. And there's so much more there to explore in your relationship with God. The resurrection power. But sometimes we're missing out. And I know that is a lesson God has taught me over time is this whole idea of believing in the resurrection. Do I actually believe in it? Why am I trying to avoid suffering or the possibility of God taking me home? Why am I trying to avoid it? It's because 
I'm not really ex exercising those muscles of faith when it comes to the resurrection. But that is a powerful thing when you begin to truly believe, not only in the cross, but the resurrection too. In the resurrection is not just a future promise, but it's a present reality because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. The Holy Spirit. And he'll give you what you need. And in verse 10, he says, he delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us on him. We have set our hope that he will deliver us again. And whatever deliverance that means, whether it be salvation in the current situation, deliverance from possible death, or whether it mean that even though you die, he will raise you from the dead. For you who have faith in Jesus Christ, there is only victory, only victory. Do you have that hope? And that's the word he uses here, hope, which is that confident expectation of something good to come in the future. Sometimes we can lose our hope and we, we think, man, there's nothing, nothing good. I turned 50 on Tuesday. Man, there's nothing good after 50. No. <laughs> no, I actually feel very different than that. But sometimes we can think that way. Man, I, don't, I can't even imagine life beyond 50 years old. In five years, I can order special menu items, you know? How cool is that? That doesn't seem right, you know? But hope says, man, I expect something good in the future. Not only do I expect something good in my 50s because the Lord is with me, but I expect something good in eternity. In Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Do you have that confident hope in something good to come? Well, verse 11, and also you must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Notice that the help goes both ways. He's like, I'm here to help you guys. So I'm going to share the comfort, but I need your prayer. And this word to help us to collaborate or work together with somebody on a common goal. And so he's calling them to be participants of the apostolic ministry of sharing the gospel and planting the church and impacting the whole world. And they are included in that work as part of Paul's team when they pray. Do you believe in prayer? Paul does. And he asked for it. He knows. I know when people are praying for me. You know, I can, I can sense it. There's power there. Well, as we apply this to our lives, two things I want to challenge us with today. Number one is that God has a purpose for your suffering. God has a purpose for your suffering. And this is hard to grasp sometimes because some people experience more suffering than others. But no, there's, there's not some predetermined amount of suffering that God fills everybody's suffering glass with the same amount. And that doesn't seem fair sometimes. But in each person's life, God has a purpose. He's written a different story and it's all to glorify him. Um, remember, when... Peter was reinstated after denying Christ three times. Jesus rose from the dead. And, and after he was reinstated, um, Jesus told him some bad news about the way he was going to suffer for Jesus, for, for Christ. It says in, in John 21, 18, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and carry you wherever you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. Uh, and after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Man, there's suffering in your future, but follow me. Now, I love this part. Peter turned and he looks back at John. 
there was always this kind of competition between the two. And so he's thinking, man, if that's my future, what about John? So Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them and the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? So John the apostle. And Peter saw him. He said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Is he going to suffer too? Come on, tell me. What's going to happen to him? And Jesus said to him, if it's my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. It's like, you follow my purpose. Don't you worry about John. And we know John was the oldest living apostle. Um, At this point, word spread that John wouldn't die till Jesus returned, which, you know, just is superstition. But do we compare ourselves with others or do we trust in God's purpose? God has a purpose. He's a loving father. Luke 11, 1. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give him some a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? You know, of course, good dads give good gifts. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask you? Notice the, the thing you don't expect. The Holy Spirit, you know, Maybe you think, well, that's kind of a consolation prize. (laughs) It's not what I was hoping for, but actually the Spirit ends up being the very power that you need to make it through your suffering. And your heavenly Father knows what you need. Well, the second thing, God wants to meet you in your suffering. It's only there He can reveal his mercy and comfort sometimes. Think of Lazarus. When Martha and Mary were suffering and they were bothered by death. In order to understand when Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life, guess what he had to do? He had to allow Lazarus to die and then raise Lazarus to life in order for them to get it. God's going to meet you there and he's going to show you something about himself. Whether he says, I'm the resurrection of life or he says, I'm the bread of life or the light of the world or whatever it is you need. Will you rely upon God in your suffering? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the fact that you are the father of mercy, the God of all comfort. And we turn our hearts to you now and we invite you into our situation that you might reveal yourself, that you might comfort us with your presence, with your word. Lord, we just open our hearts that you might help us to stop complaining that we might experience the goodness, your goodness, the fruit that grows in the valley that we're walking through. God, we just surrender to your will, not our will, but yours be done. We choose to follow you. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.